Okay, so can we start? I think so. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone from, from Europe, and uh, good morning to our panelists from the US. Thanks for joining us today at this event <coughs> organized by King Baldwin Foundation US and co hosted by ASIF, the Italian Association of Fundraisers. The event will be focused on uh, governance, how to engage your board of directors uh, to secure the future for your organizations. Uh, and this is, of course, among the major key issues for anyone in the nonprofit field. Uh, prior to let the floor to the other panelists, let me shortly introduce myself. My name is Simona Bianco. I am an international consultant and trainer in the field of strategic philanthropy and board development. Working with boards of directors is among the main lines of my profession. And I also am the author of the first Italian manual on governance and fundraising. Beyond my profession, I also am a board member too. Uh, so today I speak on behalf, speak on behalf uh, of uh, ASIF. Uh, I am the Vice President and Delegate uh, to Internationalization of ASIF, and also I am a board member of the European Fundraising Association. Just uh, a few words about ASIF. Um, ASIF is the association that represents fundraisers in Italy. We have just celebrated our 21st birthday. And our purpose is to enhance the acknowledgement of fundraising as a profession within the Italian civil society, as well as disseminate the giving culture throughout our country, also cooperating with institutions at all levels. We are structured into regional chapters to keep close links with our communities on the territories. And you can find all the information about us if at www.asif.it. Uh, before leaving the stage to the other speakers, I would also thank Elena Fotinatos at the K um, King Baldwin Foundation US and Karen Brooks Hopkins, our speakers today. Uh, I'm delighted to have you here today, Karen, and really eager to listen to your speech. So we'll see after Karen's speech and then Elena, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Simona. Hello and welcome to everybody. I'm Elena Fotinatos, the Deputy Director of the King Baudouin Foundation United States. It's great to be here and thank you so much for taking the time today. There's some familiar names in the attendee list, but for those who aren't familiar with KBFUS, please allow me a brief word. The King Baudouin Foundation United States facilitates thoughtful, effective giving to Europe and Africa. We enable U.S. donors to support their favorite causes overseas. We also provide European and African nonprofits with cost-effective solutions to raise funds in the U.S. through a tool we call an American Friends Fund. We have over 500 American Friends Funds, including with institutions like the Rijksmuseum in the Netherlands, the Bavarian State Opera in Germany, and the Breda in Italy, among others. These funds save nonprofits the trouble and expense of setting up their own 501c3 public charity. KBFUS handles all back office administration, including tax receipts and donor support. So if you have donors in the US, please feel free to reach out to me and we'd be happy to assist. And by the way, if you have donors in Canada, Europe, or in Asia, feel free to reach out as well. We have partners that can help you with donors in these countries and regions. Now, please let me turn to um, the agenda that we have today by first giving a little introductory word about the topic. When we're talking about the differences between European institutions and American institutions, the differences in the board are, are considerable. We realize that, of course. Boards look very different in Europe than they do in the US. Um, a lot of your boards might be appointed. They might be academics. Um, it's not clearly not the case in the US where a lot of institutions use their boards as a way to fundraise, which Karen will speak about more. However, I bring this up because we believe that lessons can be taken away and applied to your unique context. Some of these lessons won't be for your board, but they could be for another body that helps you fundraise, for example, an advisory council. 
I'll let the two experts talk about this more, but just wanted to lay that out um, in the introduction. Now, some additional points for you folks in the audience. You're all in listen only mode. The session is being recorded. If you have questions, please ask them through the Q&A feature, which you can see if you hover your mouse over the Zoom call, not through the chat. You should feel free to submit questions in English or Italian, no problem there. And Simona will offer the Italian reflection and initial discussion questions after Karen's presentation. Now, please allow me to introduce our first speaker, Karen Brooks Hopkins. Karen is the President Emerita of Brooklyn Academy of Music. From 1999 to 2015, she was president. She has an extensive background in the arts and cultural sector, including chair of the Cultural Institutions Group, member of the Mayor's Cultural Affairs Advisory Commission, and member of the boards of NYC and Company, the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership, and the Global Cultural District Network. She also serves on the board of the Jerome L. Green Foundation, the Trust for Governors Island, and the Alexander Anastas Foundation, where she is currently serving as senior advisor. She is the author of the widely read book, Successful Fundraising for Arts and Cultural Organizations, and the newly published memoir, Bam, and Then It Hit Me, which is available via Amazon and Powerhouse. She's been awarded honorary designations for her international work in the arts, including the Chevalier de l'Ordre d'Arts et de Lettres, sorry, I murdered that French, um, by the Republic of France, Commander of the Royal Order of the Polar Star from Sweden, and the King Olaf Medal from Norway. Without further ado, please let me welcome Karen Brooks Hopkins. Thank you so much, Karen, for joining us. We're really excited to have you speak. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay, Elena? Yes. Yes, we absolutely can. Great. Okay. Um, it's wonderful to talk to everyone today. I love doing these. Um, I mean, I wish I was there with you in person, but I'm thrilled to be able to meet all of you by Zoom. And I love being able to talk to people about fundraising boards and what your opportunity should you decide to engage in the context of an American strategy for fundraising. So I'm going to go right into it. Um, we know that it's been a really complicated year and a really uh, tough time for not for profit organizations. So now more than ever, we rely on our board members to help navigate the terrain. To survive these bad times and maximize the good times whenever they come around, we must depend on the support and partnership of our board members. So I'm going to really just get right into it and talk about the role of the board and how it impacts fundraising. As we are all aware, and as I have already stated, in the world of not-for-profit uh, administration, there is no more important and relevant leadership group than the Board of Trustees. Board service is noble service and must be taken seriously by every individual associated with the organization. Board members are generally the largest contributors in terms of time, money, and expertise to the health of an institution. In addition, Board members act as ambassadors on behalf of your organization to the world and set policy at the highest level. Board members are also responsible for succession and ultimately for the long-term viability of an institution. When I took over as BAM's chief fundraiser in 1981, I was, I was there for 36 years, president for 16, as Eleanor referenced. And um, my book is a memoir of the entire 36 years, but I began fundraising for BAM in 1981. At that point, through the fundraising work, I became the key staff member to identify and recruit board members because most of them evolved from donor relationships. This is a role that continued and was central to my work as president. Simply put, presidents, executive directors raise money. Board members are usually three types of people. Those who have a business reason for supporting an organization, for example, their company is headquartered nearby. Second, those who love the work, many board members came to BAM because of the next wave festival. Or lastly, 
those who believe and feel that board service is the best way to build and enhance the community in which they live. Over the years at BAM, our board expanded. And by the time I retired in 2015, we had over 60 members. Now, of course, this number is very unwieldy for basic business. So the real leadership at BAM uh, for intense policy decisions and day-to-day -day, uh, you know, discussions, uh, were, that was handled by an executive committee of 12 people. But naturally, the board grew as, an, as the need for increased fundraising picked up. We also wanted to make sure that our board included diverse community representation, and there was both power and virtue in maintaining such a long bo uh, large board as long as we were able to keep all of the members engaged in our mission. And I'm going to talk about how you do that. And as part of their service, generally every member is expected to participate in some way in fundraising. At BAM, we did not believe in term limits. Uh, many institutions do, we did not. We reelected our members on an annual basis. This strategy allowed us to retain loyal, generous participants and to ask those who were not participating actively to leave. So the annual setup lets you keep people that you feel are performing and also gives you a window to uh, get others to depart from the board if they are not involved. I used to say that it really didn't make sense to term limit people off our board who joined when they were young and sim simply turn them over to Lincoln Center or any other organization as they came into their wealth years later. The full board at BAM met for one and a half hours, four times a year. Each meeting consisted of a president's report, an executive producer's presentation of the upcoming roster of shows. There were committee reports, governance, real estate, finance, education, and so forth. And we always had a special presentation on a topic that was of interest, such as the Brooklyn Cultural District or a new capital project. All board meetings and committee meetings for the year ahead were meticulously planned and scheduled at the end of the prior fiscal year. I know this sounds elementary, but these kind of things are critical getting those meetings, not just the board meetings, but the committee meetings uh, for each one of these committees on the schedule a full year in advance. Every member of our board was assigned to at least one committee and each committee developed work plans for the year in order to both engage and motivate their members and produce results. Otherwise, people feel like they're wasting their time. If a committee has a work plan, if there is a definite result that is set up right at the beginning, it creates purpose, gets people more engaged, delivers a result, and helps in fundraising. There is no magic here, just common sense and good organization. We set an annual contribution goal, which we called the give or get, and then development staff were assigned to specific board members to help them achieve those goals, arrange their tickets, anything they needed, and generally to keep them involved. We found that this was an excellent way of delivering fundraising results, assigning specific staff to specific members to make sure that they touch them regularly throughout the fiscal year, which also maintains a very high level of involvement. It is much easier to work with members by generating this tightly defined plan rather than open-ended calls for help or money. Therefore, our development team together with leadership devised a strategy for each trustee at the beginning of the year and worked with them to achieve it. The trustee might be chairing a gala, uh, also contributing money, um, hosting a party, whatever it was, it went into the plan in advance. In addition to power, 
influence, and wealth, diversity is also a key factor in board composition. Of course, of course, wealthy members are crucial, but a great board is truly reflective of both its community and its audience. Racial and gender diversity are essential since the identity of the board is synonymous with that of the organization. Again, very simple, but key point. Naturally, there is the issue of recruitment. How do we find and cultivate board members? This is also an issue of research. Logic dictates that for an arts organization, most of the devoted fans come from the audience. Also, keep a close eye on lower level donors who increase their support over time, signaling a growing interest in the organization. This is another recruitment tactic. And another crucial strategy, of course, is for existing board members to invite their friends and colleagues and encourage them to get involved. You should be working on all three levels. This third type of cultivation is the most effective common sense plan for building solid board membership. For example, we had a great board member at BAM who would host fabulous dinners for his close friends and colleagues after shows that had a celebrity cast. We had to deliver the celebrities to the dinners and he delivered the prospects. Of course, it wasn't always easy to get actors like Jeffrey Rush, Fiona Shaw, Mikhail Baryshnikov, et cetera, to attend. And we had to work at it, but ultimately we pushed through and got the job done. So artists or key content providers that are connected to your work are very helpful if they agree to participate in a donor event and they should be asked to do so when it's feasible. The results of these dinners were plentiful and the dinners usually turned out to be great fun for the artists and for the guests. We identified many new board members and donors through these events and raised a lot of money from everyone who participated. Once you have identified an individual who you think would be an interesting prospect to join your board, it is essential next to create a research profile that will give you more insight into that person's history of philanthropy. Have they been generous to other organizations? Do they serve on other boards? If so, how many? Too many can be a problem regarding their available time to devote to you. What is the person's career or business or family connections? Do they live in your community? Are they associated with other members of your board? What is it about your organization that might be interesting to them? For example, if they have young children, they might gravitate towards supporting your education programs. Of course, what is their net worth, real estate holdings, et cetera. A thorough profile will help you understand both their fundraising capacity and the things that will compel them to participate. It's like uh, the question, what's important when you buy a house? Location, location, location. What's important when you're doing fundraising? Research, research, research. This is essential in terms of board recruitment. Time spent understanding someone's passion and connecting to the things that they care about regarding your work will result in a much bigger payoff than trying to convince someone to do something they don't want to do and have no interest in doing. Yes, of course, you can expand the horizons by introducing them to new ideas and programs, but it's best to start fundraising by connecting initially with their comfort zone. This work is hard enough, don't make it any harder. Once the profile has been completed, usually a small group of existing members and your staff leader, your executive director or president should host a lunch or meeting with the prospect to get to know them and talk about the organization and talk about your fundraising process. Demystify it so they know that it's coming. You should also discuss your needs and your hopes for the future. Following the lunch, if all goes well, the nomination and election process can begin. Many boards have a governance or nominating committee focused on identifying board prospects and vetting them on an ongoing basis. If you're looking to add 
board members substantially, this, this can be a very good idea. Once elected, the real fundraising work begins. And if you do this well, it will result in multiple gifts over many, many years. Here's one example of how we built a long-term successful fundraising relationship with a board member. Over the years, a gentleman named Samuel Scripps, whose family made their fortune in the newspaper publishing business, began showing up regularly for dance and theater performances. He and my former boss and predecessor of president, Harvey Lichtenstein, had struck up an acquaintance because they both not only were interested in dance, but they shared an appreciation for Indian gamelan music. As the organization's chief fundraiser at the time, I prepared a profile of Mr. Scripps and suggested that Harvey and I talk to him about the board. We followed up, went through our process, and Sam Scripps became a loyal and generous board member. But that's only the beginning of the story. When Sam passed away at the age of 80, the management of his estate went into the hands of a very talented young lawyer who was also a great fan of dance and theater. I met with him to introduce him to Bam and of course, to pay respects for Sam. The initial meeting led to a more robust relationship. And after about a year of cultivation, this executor of the estate also joined our board. He was and is an incredible board member who continued the spirit of the script philanthropy. He not only supported dance programs, he endowed scholarships for youth participating in our Dance Africa program. And ultimately, he named spaces in various BAM buildings in honor of the script's family. This member's participation and generosity continues to this day. So the lesson here is simple, a good fundraiser will always take the long view and build long-term ties and lasting relationships. At the end of each season, we would meet with board leadership and our governance committee and review via a chart each member's performance. How many shows did they attend? What funds did they contribute directly? What did they generate? Did they come to galas? Did they come to special events? The board evaluation process was critical in terms of laying out an agenda for how we would work with that specific member over the coming year. And let's not forget service. <clears throat> Remember, we are in this for the long term. Our board members, as leaders of the organization, had ongoing access to the patron desk for priority tickets and the best seats. When it comes to board cultivation and maintenance, <clears throat> this type of uh, but these type of benefits are essential. An organization is only as strong as the board, as I've said, and board members can easily be tempted to take their talent and assets somewhere else. Neglect them at your own peril. Regular communication is important. So once you have an engaged and motivated board, it is critical in terms of both fundraising and overall institutional success to keep the energy flowing. You must keep your members involved, always recognize their support and give them your time. As I always say, credit is easy, money is hard. Don't make it complicated for them to support you. And think about the ask. You've written up your profile, uh, you've put them on the correct committee, you've provided good service, you've kept them involved, now decide what combination of board members and staff should make the ask. Not too many people, keep it clear, simple, make the ask, wait a week to follow up. Here is an example of uh, the kind of impact of a project that we worked on with board members that really enforced their sense of pride and ownership in our organization. This story will demonstrate how effective it can be when the board staff relationship is really working. So we had a great moment with our board um, when we were planning the celebration of BAM's 150th anniversary. Uh, we got an enormous grant through the uh, good work of our vice chair and another active member to secure a million dollar sponsorship for the 150th from JP Morgan Chase. 
his money was fantastic and it gave us the freedom to be incredibly creative and expansive in our approach. So in addition to publishing the first ever BAM history book, and of course, hosting many great shows and some iconic artist talks, we also for the 150th launched a pro bono branding campaign created by the bank's ad agency, McGarry Bowen. So first we got the agency for free, we got the million dollars, and then McGarry Bowen spent months at BAM talking to everyone, reviewing the programs in history and absorbing the general vibe of the neighborhood. Finally, on the day of the big reveal of our branding strategy, the board leadership and executive staff convened at the office of our, of our vice chair. McGarry Bowen began by presenting the manifesto for this campaign. And here's what it was. I'm going to quote it. It can happen at a show, at the cafe. It can happen three days later while you're brushing your teeth. It can happen anywhere, really. The sense that you've been moved, altered. The beauty is it will be different for everybody. And that's what BAM is. Yes, we are theater and music and art. We are the Harvey, the Howard Gilman Opera House, the BAM Fisher and the BAM Rose Cinemas jazz, drinks, galas, and talks. We are so many things, but at that moment of impact, that's the reason we're here. At that moment, when it happens, you know it, bam, and then it hits you. When the executives of McGarry Bowen finished presenting this storyboard and some slides and examples of how the campaign would look, we were all breathless with excitement. And in unison, the board and staff present in the room leapt to their feet with a rousing cheer and a spontaneous standing ovation. Bam had hit us once again. The campaign played out with ads placed in subways, bus shelters, and online. It went viral and our anniversary season soared, moving the organization to the next level. Keeping this kind of close contact and involving your board on a regular basis is essential. Letting them share the enthusiasm for programs and your success. Every Friday, I would send out a short email to the members of the board, updating them on the most compelling events of the past week, important institutional and community issues, big grants, as well as upcoming programs. And then another important note in conjunction with this whole thing is the relationship with the chairman, which is fundamental to your success. My chairman and I function as a highly effective team, both in terms of leading the board, balancing the budget, building the endowment, and planning for the expansion of our facilities. Together, we work with our colleagues from other organizations in the neighborhood and as strategists in forming the Brooklyn Cultural District. I spoke to my chairman practically every day, and our partnership was the highlight of my career. The effective connection to your chair sets the tone for the entire character of the organization. So during this time of so much unrest, plus budget stress and uncertainty, the relationship between the executive director, the chair, and your full board is the difference between success and failure. It will also impact your long-term fundraising results for years to come. Ultimately, as I have said before, our goal is long-term engagement, ongoing generous contributions, and having an organization that runs like a well-oiled machine. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Karen. I, I was listening carefully. Can you hear me? I, I think so. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it was really interesting to, to listen to your presentation and I took many notes. <laughs> so before uh, asking you for some questions and I, I would also invite the participants to ask their questions too. Uh, I, would, I would 
point out a couple of a couple of things. Uh, that is to say, um, I would look at the, the governance perspective from a double point of view. That is to say, from the point of view of fundraisers and I mean development officers in general. Um, I would say that they cannot call them out from the governance issues. That is to say, they that having the board on board, it's is up to them, it's among their duties. So I think that, um, and it's really clear to me, especially from the pandemic on world, uh, so this period um, too, that it's time for a crucial shift in the role and the perception of the role for fundraisers. Uh, I mean, they, of course, should be techniques experts with some seniority and so on, but I think that, they should mainly be change makers, agents of good. So uh, in, uh, as a sort of philanthropy, as a lifestyle, I think that working a, uh, as fundraisers um, is a really great chance for them to fully embody the values they believe in and use this kind of value to engage, to involve, and to help the governance, their governance, to shape the future and the development of their organization. So I think that the first part of our future, I mean, in the nonprofit field, in the fundraising field, is connected to the role of fundraisers and their relationship with the boards of, with their boards of directors. And they can do a lot to enhance and to improve and to develop these relationships, but I, this relationship, but I think that they cannot call them out from this relationship and simply say, uh, my board is absent or my board, my board members don't, don't respond to my appeals and so on. And so this is the first part. The second perspective from my point of view, and I mean, it reflects, uh, both my Italian experience as well as my European experience, because I usually work at a European level. Um, of course, as you have said, uh, board members and boards in general are relationship builders, both internally and externally. So they have, the, they have to enhance and to encourage cooperation, learning and exchange to improve how to serve their mission. So I think that, and it's like the, a sort of parallel with what I've said before for fundraisers, they, the board members should be from my point of view, demanding for fundraisers and feel called into action personally. They should be bold and should be, yeah, really demanding for fundraiser to, um, to keep the best from them, from the, their cooperation. So internally, relationships builders internally before externally, of course, then they have to go outside. And then what I think is mainly important these days is uh, considering board members in terms of visionary leadership. I think that uh, it's the, the most important way, the most important approach able to foster change. So it's just a question of, um, I would say philosophy, not just techniques uh, and expectations, it's just an approach, a way of living. And I think that uh, um, what we are called to is to be an I say this in, from my board, <laughs> board member perspective, uh, be inspirational leaders to shape the future for uh, nonprofit organizations through bold vision of their future. I think that we, um, that we have great challenges ahead. And this pandemic, from my point, made us aware about the great challenges. And I think it's a very good, a, a huge chance for both for fundraisers and to be bold and to be ambitious. Um, coming to uh, more specifically to your point, uh, I, I have a couple of questions just to, yeah, to break the ice and to introduce them. Um, I think that um, one of the most important thing 
to do when, in order to identify the best board for a specific organization is to, um, to set up, to build um, a role, to build a profile, the, the desired profile for the desired board. Um, it's something that it's not that common in Italy. It's something that I'm, I'm really convinced of. Uh, so my first question is, what would you say to an organization um, to convince them to look at how to shape their board of directors uh, using proper profiles, uh, definition of roles uh, and expectation and, and so on. And then, yeah, please, uh, then I would ask the second one. Look, this may sound a little forceful, but the fact is that when you are engaged in a significant fundraising operation, an annual campaign, this is like a military uh, operation. And you have to make sure that all your flanks are in order and the board is really where you start. Um, you want to make sure, as I say, that you have a committed board, an interesting board. I just went through um, a lot of ideas about how you can find these people. They come, if you're right out of your audience, they come out of your neighborhood, they come out of the corporate world. You also, uh, you look for different kinds of expertise. So for example, if you're an institution that has a lot of marketing needs, then it's clear that you want some marketing people on your board. It's always great having finance people on the board. You know, you look for people that are moving the money around within a community, not just to have wealth. And then that is how you begin to, and you also look at your own mission and then try to create certain alignments uh, with your membership. Uh, fundraising research is very simple today because of the number of uh, database uh, opportunities that anyone can have um, and getting a um, seasoned research person can explain what databases the organization should have. You can also find the foundation center library that is in your city and access uh, their profiles and information and books. Uh, they usually have a training session of how you can put together this kind of research. Um, it's not that complicated, but what it does is it, 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 it's everything because it gives you the right preparation. You also learn more about the prospect, what they're interested in, in and that makes your job so much easier your fundraising plan. So um, we relied on fundraising research um, every step of the way, shaping the annual campaign, shaping the board and major gift uh, prospect uh, strategies. Um, these things are crucial if you're going to engage in serious fundraising. Thank you very much. And uh, I noticed that there are a couple of questions, so I would let the floor to Elena to share these questions prior to, to ask my ones. Sure, happy to. So we have a question for Karen. Um, when you asked the supporter to join BAM4, did you spell it outright that they were expected to donate or did you pinpoint a specific goal that they would raise involving other donors? Um, we would be very transparent and talk to people. So let's say that um, I'm talking to you about joining the board First, I would be very clear about how thrilled we were that you had shown interest, that you had been, say, a loyal member of our audience or community, um, that you had, uh, you know, things that we that we saw that you're a passionate theater goer, you know, things that show that you've been paying attention to who this person is and what their interests are. And then next, you begin to talk a little bit with them about the board. Um, about what the, uh, uh, the work is. Everyone's asked to join a committee. There are four meetings a year. We hope that you will come to performances. We'd like you to attend galas. And obviously we have a give or get commitment of say $50,000 per board member. Every organization is different. FAM was a large organization. That's what our give or get was. Some places might have a $5,000 commitment. It doesn't matter. Whatever you decide it is. And then you say to them, 
and we um, will be working with you to help you be successful. We've been thinking based on um, your interest and background that perhaps you might consider chairing a gala, you might consider uh, hosting an event for um, you know, the real estate community, if a person was involved in that. The research would help us put together the ask. We would also look in the research of what they were giving other organizations so we would be able to tell whether they uh, were able to commit at the level that we were looking for. And we did that in advance. Um, look, not every board member met the goal every year and you're not gonna go chasing people. You know, you're gonna use good manners and good behavior. But if it looks like the person can advance the cause of the institution, if it looks like the person can make a contribution, generate a contribution, um, you know, help in a way that will move your institution forward, then the person becomes a useful board, board prospect. But remember, it's a two-way street. They want things from you, you want things from them. And this is how you build a solid relationship and an excellent group that are all working as a team on behalf of your organization. Thank you, Karen. I mean, the worst and, thing that can happen is if somebody says no. So exactly. that, you have to really think about fundraising like that. The worst thing that happens, and it happens every minute, we live with rejection and, and that's part of our, of our life. But the worst thing that can happen is the person says, you know, I'm really not that interested. And no, I don't want to give. Okay, on to the next. I had one guy who loved BAM, came all the time made contributions moving up and up and up. And I asked him to join the board and he said no, but kept working, kept inviting him. A year later, he called and said, now I'm ready, I wanna do it. And became one of our most generous donors and a great board member. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is the fundraiser's creed. You have to hang in. Thank you for that, Karen, and for that encouragement. Uh, Simona, I have a follow-up related to what Karen was just saying that it might be more for you actually, if that's okay. And then maybe Karen has some insights as well, but I think it's more appropriate that I pose it to you first. Um, how, for our friends in Europe, obviously, how do you introduce the idea of a fundraising board in the cultural context where it's not the norm, uh, especially if a member says they are giving because they're giving their time to being part of the board? Yeah, sorry, I missed the, the last part of the, the, the question. Can you, can you repeat me, please? Sure, I was saying for these folks um, in the audience, they would like to know how do, how do you introduce the idea of a fundraising board in a culture or context where it's not the norm, especially if the, if the member says, listen, I'm already giving you my time, <laughs> that's valuable. Yeah, okay, um, thank you very much. I, I, I think it's one of the most effective idea to advance fundraising. Uh, from my personal experience, it's something that I use, uh, that I usually suggest to the organization I work with each time uh, that uh, there is the need to enhance, to, 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 yeah, to enhance the network, the links within certain communities. Uh, I think that uh, it's something really effective and is helpful to also to strengthen the internal culture in terms of fundraising. Uh, sometimes, and I remember I'm referring to an experience of many years ago, uh, I remember that I suggested to the then board members, the president and vice president, uh, to, to start to shape, to set up a, a fundraising committee, an internal fundraising committee uh, made of uh, uh, representatives of companies or uh, institutions of uh, professionals in that specific uh, uh, geographic area because uh, it, it was uh, useful to encourage the board of directors that fundraising is something not that scary. It's something that they could, could have managed uh, with uh, uh, having no fear of this, uh, of this point. So I think that it's a way to, 
to integrate fundraising within an organization and also to, um, I would say, to, to strengthen the links between the board of directors and the fundraising staff. So I think it's a sort of intermediate level of strategy that I would, I would suggest to, to integrate. Eleanor, would you like me to add to that? If, if you, yeah, if you have yeah. any of those. I, I, know, I know that for um, our European college, sometimes it's hard to get this going and that because it's not ingrained in the, uh, in, in the way that organizations work outside of the United States. Sometimes what I like to suggest then is that you start with a project and that you keep the ask fairly minimal but that if you present a really exciting specific project to your board and say, uh, we're gonna try something new here. We're gonna ask everybody to get involved. Um, it's not going to be uh, too heavy of a lift. Sometimes if you go to a corporation or a foundation and you can set it up as a matching grant, the XYZ Foundation has given us a certain amount. We're gonna try to match it and we would really love to have 100% participation from our board. We realize that this is a change um, in, in the way that we've worked before, but we feel that we have a powerful opportunity here um, because we can um, pull out a special project and really make so much more out of it if we have a little more money. So I think that what you try to do is you just sort of massage it in there and say, we'd also like to try this as a test run to see if we can ramp up fundraising. And the best people to test it on are our very own board. Again, everyone should do what's comfortable. And um, in that case, you might not want to start with the give or get. That if that's not going to work at the beginning, then you back it down, find a project or two, um, sometimes people, in our case, they gave gifts of works of art, which we then sold. We did BAM art was a strategy that we had. Um, I had someone once who gave me a boat and we sold it. I mean, you know, these were, you know, we had, uh, we had a tax deduction situation in America. And I'm not sure in Europe whether these kind of incentives exist, but most people gave because they really wanted to support the organization. So I suggest that you start slowly and what and you share the success with everyone. If everyone feels that this is successful and they've done it in a brilliant way the first time around, it's so much easier the second, the third, and the fourth. But you've got to start somewhere. And, uh, and the board that is already committed to the organization is a good place to start. Sometimes the other thing I would do was I would go to two or three of the members and ask them to tee up the first gift so you knew you were going to get something and then that became a good example for everybody else to jump in okay thanks karen i just want to add just one more question for me um coming to the point uh, about the need to uh, to encourage board members to feel um, involved and engaged in fundraising for their organization, I would I would know if you have ever experienced the situation of a board member which is formally in his or her role, uh, but not that committed. So I mean, someone uh, hired as a board member because it's a friend of the president or because it's uh, or she was requested to, to join the board. And if so, how did, did you manage that kind of board members? Um, we had a number of members that were appointed, you know, that uh, the city council had a member on our board, the borough president had a member on our board. Um, and the idea was to uh, their role might be slightly different than a person, say, who's coming from the audience or from a local business, but it was also critical that we work with them to deliver government support, to deliver capital project support, uh, to help get through certain bureaucracies that might uh, be holding us up if it came to um, government or through their special relationships. You know, um, so there were 
that's why we did the research because for our needs, we were constantly looking to find board members that could help ease the path in some way. Uh, board members who could introduce us to communities that we might not have as much access to that we wanted to meet. Um, board, you know, there. So that's the thing is to look back and see what what do we need and what type of board members are going to help us uh, meet those needs. And then that's when the research process would begin. So, for example, if it was clear that we were doing French cultural projects every year, a lot of them, it certainly made sense to have someone on the board that was particularly interested in those kinds of projects. And so we would look for someone who um, was involved with the French Foundation or somebody who, you know, would, would, we would, we would do it based on the work. Who do we need? How do we get them? And what can they do for the institution? And what can we do for them? Again, the two-way street. So it went like that. Sometimes a person would join because of the project and then get involved in the whole institution. And that was the goal, was to keep moving them up the food chain. Totally agree with you, Karen, <laughs> definitely. Karen, we have another question from the audience. Um, this person says, I'm currently setting up a development board at my university. It will be a group of Europe-based members. What are the top three things to take into consideration in the selection and setup of it? P.S. The first appointees will definitely also be political nominees. So let me just be clear. You're setting up a development committee. So this is going to be a fundraising apparatus. Can I understand it that way, Ellen? That That's what I understood the question to mean as well. Uh, she says, it, or he says, a development board. Okay, so if you're looking for um, money, then you need to have people who have the capacity to give it. Now, you might look to alumni of the university. <clears throat> Again, look for people that have business relationships with that university. Uh, look for people that are in that community who care about its success. And then uh, you partner them with the political people uh, in order to have a very uh, strong and functioning group. In the beginning, you don't want to put too many people on, but you don't want it to be so small that you don't have enough action. So you probably want <clears throat> somewhere between six and eight people ultimately on such a committee, depending on what the work is. You wanna have a work plan as I talked about, and then you wanna have a budget so that you can understand what, what is the committee trying to accomplish on behalf of the university and what is the, what is the need? And then usually what I try to do was go out and get uh, an initial gift, whether it be from a foundation, a, a corporation, or major gifts, and then you've set the table with some money that's already there. If it's government money, that's okay too. Um, when that money is there, then you start being able to ask people and come up with strategies that are going to add the matching gift. Um, maybe it's a gala. Maybe it's a fundraising party. Maybe it's an art sale. Maybe it's an auction. There are many different ways to raise money. And essentially you want a plan for all of them. Remember before I said, it's like a military operation. So you wanna have all your constituents lined up. What is your plan for foundations? What is your plan for corporate and business? What is your plan for major gifts? What is your plan for lower level members? What is your plan for special events? What is your plan for government? And then when you put it all together, and have a goal for each one of these constituents, that's the goal of your campaign. That becomes the basis of your annual campaign. So you want to be strategically aligned on every front of this thing. That doesn't mean you're gonna be successful with all of them, but you're gonna be loading up the prospects in each one of those areas um, in the hope that you will be successful enough of the time that you're gonna reach your goal. I hope that answers it. I think it does. And Simona, I think you had a couple of points you wanted to add. Uh, yeah, it was just a comment because uh, among the notes I took before uh, is that uh, you said, Karen, uh, something that I find really interesting and, uh, and 
uh, that I agree with uh, that each mem each board member is expected to participate to fundraising. It's something that it's not that uh, well known in the Italian culture. Uh, fundraising is a relatively recently uh, profession. And so many, not the major part, but many board members uh, don't know that fundraising is not just asking for money to their friends. So there is a lot of training, a lot of training to, uh, to do with them uh, and also to encourage them to feel involved uh, into fundraising as uh, an opportunity to networking and to advance their, their mission. Uh, I'm very interested in this point because I think it's uh, very different from the American culture where probably this is more, uh, um, an easier thing to communicate and an expectation that board members already know before um, entering their role. Um, how do you, uh, it, it's of course a question of culture of, of different uh, historical background and that, that, that's it. Uh, but um, with the, 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 the perception of course in the last years um, grew a lot in Italy too. So um, fundraising is something that uh, is, I would say more popular nowadays. How would you, um, how would you ask or uh, present a new board members, a new, new board member, uh, this expectation, how to, to fundraise? I think that uh, it's all part of that initial discussion. Um, Yes, of course, uh, we would like to uh, get involved in some fundraising. Uh, we're going to start with X, Y, or Z project. Uh, we would tell this to the board member that you're meeting with, that you're recruiting. Um, we'd like to involve you in this. We will work with you to make sure that it doesn't get out of control. Um, everything will be done within a comfort level. Nobody is going to be running off and asking people on your behalf without your permission. And together, we're going to come up with a good plan these are some initial thoughts that our staff has had so that we can all be successful here. Um, thus far, we've gotten so-and-so to make a, an initial gift and we're gonna try to add some matching, get the whole board involved. Generally, you want the chairman to help set the table for this. So having a chairman that's down for fundraising is gonna certainly make things a lot easier. If they're not, it's gonna really be a problem. So that's why you, you, know, you just talk about it in the most straightforward, uncomplicated way, but you have a plan set up in advance so that the person isn't standing around like waiting to be asked what to do. You've thought about what you want them to do and how you can help make them successful. That's what this is all about. It's just taking the sting out of it and helping to make it successful for somebody who's involved in it. That that the giving should be a pleasure in a certain way. Um, you know, I remember when we did the naming of the Opera House and we got a, a name in honor of a long-term donor who had passed away and we did a dinner on the Opera House stage for, um, for all of that foundation's colleagues and friends and so on and so on. And we did a dinner and when we, um, announced it, everybody was sitting in the audience, and then we had the curtain go up on the stage, and that was all the tables for the dinner, and we invited everybody up, and we had some music, and we had some talking, and then um, we did a tribute, we cut the ribbon, everybody was part of it, and everybody felt good, and then the next day, we sent a letter out to all of those people who were at the dinner, with the permission of the foundation, of course, asking them to support the new opera house that had been named in honor of their friend and colleague. And a lot of people sent in money. So you gotta be on the ball and be ready to follow up. And you know, when you think about fundraising, you have to really just think about fundraising. Fundraising is a very practical thing. It's not a theoretical thing. It's not about trying hard, even though that's important. It's about getting money. So you have to think about it in the most practical bottom line way of how we would be successful in this 
and how do you make it a success for everyone who's participating um, so that you take the edge off of it? And you have to be set up to do this before you go out and ask. Thank you very much. Karen, I do have another question and for folks in the audience, if you have any burning questions, now's the time to submit them because we're going to be coming to a close, uh, but we do have some time left. Um, you mentioned that the board should reflect the organization in terms of gender and race. What about age? Do you think junior boards or something organizations should take more seriously? I think it depends on the organization, but I do think it's very important to continue to bring young people on I think it's, it's uh, all of these things, who will help make the organization the most interesting, strongest, well-functioning place? And clearly having people um, with different kinds of experiences, um, race, uh, gender, age, these are all important things as long as you, the staff, make it a good experience for each one of your members. If you just put them on there, and expect for them to do everything without your support, you're, you're not going to get them involved. You have to involve them. So when you invite them to join, you want to make sure you have a role for them. And if part of the role, uh, if having a junior board is a good uh, way to recruit young people, and then maybe the president of the junior board serves on the big board for a year or two, and then it's a rotating position for who's ever president of the junior board, that's a good way to get that person involved in the whole institution and to bring those um, lessons learned back to the junior board. So yeah, I think it's important to be open about these things, not be rigid. You just want to be successful. Mm -hmm. We have another question here um, for somebody who works for a European university and they're planning to set up a fundraising board specifically focused on the U.S. There's a practical question. From your experience, how important is it to have physical board meetings versus online virtual meetings? With COVID and the likelihood of board members coming from different time zones, I'm curious about your thoughts on how to best engage, manage the board as a collective and as individuals. Um, I think if you can get people to come once a year to join together, that it's fantastic. I'm on the Onassis board. And I love the board meetings because we have them all over the world. And um, I've really gotten to know these people. And it's great when we have dinners and we have opportunities to really engage. Uh, but we've also had successful online board meetings. So I think you go back again and you say what's going to work and what's going to give people the greatest sense of ownership with the institution. That's what this whole thing is about. It's about building this sense of ownership over long periods of time, this total connectedness. And so I like the idea of trying to get everybody together once a year at least, um, because I think that it creates more of a family. And when you have more of a family, you have a better chance to be successful in fundraising and in every other way. And I think I have probably what's the last question and then Simona, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, Karen, how can you measure board effectiveness or guide the board to evaluate their own performance? I imagine this could be particularly helpful if you are looking for ways to encourage less effective board members to cycle off of the board. Um, we kept a chart, as I say, we had a governance committee. We kept a chart of every board member's participation. How many shows did they come to? Did they come to the gala? Did they meet their fundraising commitments? Uh, did they uh, come to committee meetings? Um, in every way we looked at it. And if we felt, I mean, sometimes people have a problem. Someone's sick, something happens. All right, so you just give them a pass. I, I don't believe in being a bureaucrat about any of this stuff. But if someone is habitually not interested and not participating and so forth, the thing to do is to speak to them about it. Um, we, uh, we saw that you weren't able to come to any shows or meetings, you know, in the last year. Um, we're really trying to maximize every seat on the board so that we can have uh, the most effective um, participation, both in fundraising, both in, in programs and so on. Do you want to stay and are you able to put the time in? 
Um, and I think you just ask people. Sometimes I had people that had been on the board forever, and it was clear that I needed to make room and to get them off, that they weren't able to uh, support the place at the level they once were. So we created an honorary board and said, you're part of the family. We want you to stay involved, but we want to make space for some young people and some new people to come on. Uh, we know you'd rather have a little less stress on fundraising at this point. Are you okay shifting over to honorary? And then we would do certain things for the honorary board members during the year. And they were always got the patron desk and the other things they'd become accustomed to. So there are different ways that you can manage the process and still make everybody feel okay. Great, I love the suggestion. I think you've come to the end of our questions. And before I turn it over to Simona to give us some final thoughts, I just wanted to thank you again, Karen, for a really interesting conversation today. I really appreciate it. We all do. Thank you so much. Okay, best of luck, everybody. Don't give up. You can do it. <laughs> thank you so much, Karen. Simona? Yeah, just a couple of things to, to conclude. I would uh, thank Karen, too, for her, her speech and... Um, she mentioned a word that I really appreciated and I wrote it down. Uh, um, being a board member as a noble mission. I think it's really important and also because it, it allows me to remind that there is an expression which, is, which cannot be translated it into Italian, which is to serve as a board member. It's something that I usually mention in my presentations because I, I think that it is exactly what I think about being a board member. So I would thank you, Karen, for your words and your perspective and sharing your, your thoughts from the other side of the ocean. I think it's important to learn from each other because exchanging experiences is the only way, from my point of view, to go ahead and to advance our, our mission and grab the best practices across the globe. <laughs> so thank you very much to you all. Thanks, Elena and Lindsay and Samantha and everyone uh, and the participants, of course. And yeah, the word is to you, Elena. Great. Thank you, Simona. Just a last word to say thank you so much, Simona, for your partnership. Thank you once again to Karen for a wonderful presentation. Thank you to ASIF for co-sponsoring. And if you have any questions about KBFUS, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you so much, everybody.